please welcome Senior Research Scientist at Punch Cyber, Mr. Jacob Baxter. Good afternoon. Today I'm here to tell you that we have to do something different to be successful at network cyber defense at scale. We have to move beyond traditional rule-based detection and fixed fingerprints. And we can do this by leveraging artificial intelligence to adapt to changing adversary tactics. However, we must do more than produce purely statistical anomalies. And so we can do this by focusing our AI research on capturing the contextual semantics that are present within the domain. And we can take these semantics and use them to drive further downstream tasks. Taking our semantic results and presenting them alongside domain context will give our cyber analysts what they need to understand and interpret our results and formulate hypotheses that allow them to go about their job. If we can accomplish this, this will open up many new doors for AI to impact the cybersecurity field, including context-driven rather than strictly math-driven anomaly detection. So here are some of the things we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna talk about some of the challenges with two of the current approaches. So one is the naive anomaly detection approach, which produces too many results and results that lack context other than the fact that things are a certain distance outside of normal. And then we're gonna talk about present day defense techniques and how they don't scale to adversaries changing tactics. So take for instance, something like a zero day vulnerability. From the point of disclosure over the next year, we can see up to 100,000 new variants of exploits taking advantage of that vulnerability. And what this means is that each one of those variants could potentially require a different signature. And so this is why we're gonna need a new approach. And for this new approach, what we're going to need to do is construct a semantic feature space that actually captures the functions of what's happening within the domain. Then we're gonna use dimensionality reduction to achieve scalability in our computations, as well as to bring things down to two dimensions where our visual cortex can come into play understanding the results. And then, with this visual intu intuition, we'll use good design to bring in domain context such that our analysts are in a place where they can immediately operate off of the results of our algorithms. So what is the naive anomaly problem? Imagine pairing a cyber expert and an AI expert, and quite quickly they're gonna have a conversation about what a major problem in the field is. And they're gonna decide that it probably comes down to differentiating good from bad, a binary classification problem. And so the AI expert is gonna say to the cyber expert, well, you know, if you just give me some labels, I can do this. And the cyber analyst is gonna chuckle for a variety of reasons. The low base rate in the field makes getting good labels hard. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort. And in general, there's just this very large class imbalance. And so they're gonna let the AI expert know this. And the AI expert's gonna sit back and say, hmm, maybe that's not such a big problem actually. We have this entire portion of our field dedicated to finding weird stuff, anomaly detection. And if we take weird as a proxy for bad, then we're off to the races. And so that's the route they're gonna go down. But the problem is we have extremely low base rates of true positives, bad activity in this field. And when you have such low base rates, it's a matter of math, not of how good your algorithms are, that you're always going to have more false positives than you will true positives. So here's a case where we can work through. So what we've done is we've looked at the 20 billion connected internet devices that exist. And we're assuming a naive anomaly approach, meaning we're going to randomly sample from those 20 billion devices. 
When we randomly sample, looking at how many of those devices would be controlled by an adversary, if we picked one million devices, there would be five true positives, five bad ones in it. And so when we're starting out research and we presume some certain detection rates for our algorithm, such as a 10% false positive rate and an 80% true positive rate, what this means is we're gonna have 10% of a million or 100,000 false positives and we're gonna have 80% of five, so four true positives. This means our analyst is going to have to process 100,000 results to find four real ones that mattered. And each one of those could take anywhere from five minutes to an hour or more of our analyst's time. And because every anomaly requires processing by our analysts, this doesn't scale for them, and so it won't scale for our application of AI to this problem. Now, how about present-day defense? So this is what present-day defense looks like. We know a particular description of something that's bad. And then we have data that we're watching to see if that known bad thing occurs within our data. And the great thing is this works, computers can provide us a match, and our analysts love it because they know exactly what the context is. They know, hey, this IP address was present in our network traffic, it's owned by this particular country, it's doing this particular function. And so they get all of the context. But the problem with this is adversaries aren't static and changing these indicators are all too easy. They may be using multiple IP addresses, they can change them by owning new IP addresses, standing up new infrastructure, and doing all kinds of things on a monthly or maybe even a daily basis, whatever they want to script. And so really there's another question we need to answer. And so that question is, if we know about one case of bad activity, can we find the similar cases that are acting similar to that? And so when I ask that question from this data, it becomes much harder to use this representation to do anything meaningful. And we can look at the subnets in the octets in the data and see, yeah, there's this 10.234.11.1 that is similar to the 10.234.11.2. But if you knew enough to do this, you know that this is more a consequence of provisioning or software implementation, and it has nothing to do with the functional roles being played by each of those IP addresses. But what about if I gave you a different view? So here in this view, it's much easier to answer the question of similarity. I know I personally would just rely on the geometric interpretation, and I'd decide that there are two clusters here, one at the top and one at the bottom. And in the one at the top, we can see there are two particular assets that are very close. And the great thing is, this kind of representation is something AI and machine learning excels at producing. But there's still a problem, and the problem is, if I handed this to a cyber analyst, they're not gonna be able to necessarily make heads or tails of it other than deciding what's similar. So how about one more view? So here's a view where what we've done is we've taken the domain context and we've brought it in so that we can see what's going on. And now our analysts can understand this picture of similarity in their terms. And they can see that the two overlapping blue IP addresses are performing a DNS redirection function for an adversary's campaign. And they're redirecting to a particular command and control server. And so that's what creates the similarity in the top cluster. And then they can also resolve the similarity we saw in the IP addresses and realize that that was just due to the fact that the adversary is operating out of a cloud provider's infrastructure and it happened to sit in the same region as one of the cloud provider's own DNS servers. And so this picture here is exactly what we want to achieve. So how do we do this? So here's a general recipe. The first step of this recipe is we need to construct an appropriate representation of our data. And what I mean by this is it must be able to support the conclusions we want. So if we have two similar entities, they must be similar in the data. 
So for instance, one command and control server must be measurably similar to another command and control server. But that's not it. It must also be measurably different from something it's not akin to. So a command and control server must be measurably different within the data from a VPN. And so I would argue this is really the critical place to start building traction for AI to have a greater impact. Once we have this feature space, we can pick a method to embed semantics. And so in the field, there's kind of two major ways to do this. One is to do latent factor analysis, um, and there are both linear and nonlinear techniques to do this, and the other is to do manifold discovery. And so the two key ideas here are, in the latent factor analysis case, we get kind of a proportional understanding of how much every entity we're looking at, every IP address, is expressed by one of these low dimensional factors. In the case of manifold discovery, what's happening is our data lies on this high dimensional manifold. And the idea here, according to the manifold hypothesis, is that our data is meaningfully structured on this manifold. But the problem is, since it's in high dimensions, we can't visualize what's going on. So we need to carefully deconstruct that manifold and bring it down to two dimensions so that we can preserve how the data is laid out on that manifold and gain the intuition from it. And once we have this, then we have a way to produce interpretable results that we can then iterate on, evaluate with our cyber analysts and ensure our approach is working. So what does it look like to construct a representation? So here's what it might look like to construct a representation for a particular type of cyber data. What we see here is network flow which is a type of data that captures the metadata of conversations between computers. And so what we see on the left is taking a bunch of time-based transactions for a particular IP address and aggregating or pivoting them within a single row for that IP address for a particular time window. And so what this effectively does is for that IP address, it gives it a high dimensional representation where each one of those columns, SSH, HTTPS, and DNS, becomes a coordinate axis in the higher dimensional space. In this case, since it's three dimensions, it becomes X, Y, and Z. And so when we do this for a large number of IP addresses, effectively what we get is every IP address becomes a point in three dimensional space. And this is what that looks like. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that in reality, we're not dealing with three dimensions. We've left it in three dimensions here so that we can understand what's happening when we go from three dimensions down to a lower dimensional space. But often our research focuses on feature spaces that can be hundreds to thousands of dimensions. And that's really why we have to go through this dimensionality reduction process. So what does dimensionality reduction consist of and look like? Well, the big idea here is that we're going to set up some kind of loss function that describes how well we're doing at meeting a particular objective we care about. And so in this case, we're looking to capture a lower dimensional representation that notes some of the things we see going on in the higher dimensional space. And so here what we see is that in three dimensions, we've got the green, the red, and the purple points are lying on this common line that they're kind of distributed on in the diagonal. And then we've got the blue and the purple points sitting just above the x, y axis. So we'd like to formulate an optimization process that's going to capture this. And this is what that looks like. This is our loss function being optimized to achieve a good low dimensional representation of the patterns we see. So we see the green, the red, and the purple points being brought to be collinear, and then the blue points are brought closest to the purple points because that is the layout that achieves the minimum value in our search process to capture uh, the semantics we see in the higher dimensional space. And so that's really what's going on when we do this dimensionality reduction. And so what does that net us? 
Well, what it nets us is a trained model, which again, if we pick certain techniques, amounts to doing a bunch of matrix or tensor algebra. And so once we've trained our model, we have a converged matrix that is, relatively speaking, very lightweight, as well as a couple nonlinearities if we've chosen a model with multiple layers um, and nonlinearities. And so the great thing about this is given the scale of the cyber problem, we can actually take this model and distribute it out to the edge of our environments. Furthermore, it's highly amenable to many different forms of computation. So you could install this in a big data platform, you could put it in a Zeek script, which is a network monitoring scripting language, you could implement it in streaming or in batch mode. And so that's one of the other great powers of doing this dimensionality reduction technique and building algorithms which operate around matrix and tensor algebra. So what does this look like in practice? So here's kind of a first use case where what we've done is we've taken network flow from outside of an enterprise from a particular portion of the internet where we think that an adversary could be operating from. And so what we want to do is use this semantic feature space to drive essentially an information retrieval problem. So as kind of presented before, what we'd like to do is say, we know about one particular exit point that the adversary is using. Can we find other ones within this data that are similar? And so while this is an area of ongoing research, what we can see here is we get this really good behavioral clustering between our data points. And so that's exactly what we want, and we can continue to build off of this. Now let's look at another use case to see other ways that this can be used. So here's a case where what we've done is we've taken network flow from inside of an enterprise. And we've done the same feature representation and done the same dimensionality reduction technique. The one difference here is that we know the system roles. However, our algorithm has no knowledge of this. So that's really great because we can see that our algorithm in an unsupervised fashion has successfully captured the differences between our different classes. So it's successfully unpacked the high dimensional manifold into two dimensions where we can understand it and make sense of what's going on. And so we see this great class uh, separation in the way that we've got this large cluster of computers in the middle in orange, We've got the vulnerability scanners very well clustered in purple. And then down to the right, we've got the domain controllers clustered in maroon. But there's actually something interesting going on here. So we actually see two types of mixing within this data. One of those is represented by the three arrows where we see IP addresses mixing with computers. The other is represented by the orange arrow where we see one computer mixing with a bunch of VPNs. And so we have to look at the domain context to figure out what's going on. And so the context for the IP and computer mixture here is that the only difference between IPs and computers is that in this data set, there was no host name for the IP addresses. But from a functional standpoint, there was no behavioral difference in the role those two types of devices were playing within the enterprise. And so that's not interesting to us, and we can discard it. But in the case of the single computer clustering with the VPNs, that's very weird because a computer is something that a user is sitting behind to do their various tasks. A VPN, on the other hand, is a bunch of services that's performing this translator role between the outside and the inside of your network. And it's generally all automated. It tends to talk to many computers on the outside and bring them in to talk to internal services on the inside of your network. So let's zoom in on that. So when we look at the semantics of this and really focusing on why the computer is acting like a VPN, what we see is that the computer in this time window talked to 231 unique known destination ports. And normally a computer would only talk to a few of these known ports uh, necessary for things like email or web traffic 
but definitely not such a large array of uh, destination ports. And then simultaneously, it has a very, very high count of sessions to ephemeral ports. And so traditionally, this is how servers talk to computers. Computers spin up an ephemeral port, initiate a connection to a server, and the server responds back from this known port back to the computer's ephemeral port. So we kind of see this behavior where it's both talking to a lot of computers and a lot of internal services, and in this way is performing a role that's very akin to a VPN, and this is what our algorithms picked up on. And the great thing about this is this brings us to a place where our cyber analyst is able to immediately form potential hypotheses to explain what's going on. And so three of the hypotheses they could come up with is one, this asset is mislabeled. It's not being appropriately tracked by the organization, and so they need to go and make sure they're appropriately tracking all of the cases of this type of critical asset. Another is that a user has taken an action, such as installing software to make this machine behave like a VPN, and that could possibly be against policy. And a third potential hypothesis would be that it's an adversary action, and the adversary has done something on the machine, opened up services, and started to use it as a pivot point internal to the network. And all of those are important hypotheses for our analysts to be able to form, and from which they can immediately dive into other data to confirm or deny what's happening versus were they presented that this particular computer is five standard deviations outside of normal computer behavior. And so this is exactly the place where we want to take our pairing of AI with the cyber defense problem. We want to make sure that our AI research is capturing the necessary domain context. So in summary, We've done this by building a couple of beneficial components. We've built a semantic feature space that captures what's going on. We've employed dimensionality reduction to help us make sense of the semantics captured within that space. We've also gained scalability from that dimensionality reduction. We've gained a visual intuition, and then alongside that visual intuition, we've used UI design to bring in the other domain context that our analysts need to be able to formulate hypotheses. And the great thing is that while we've spent a lot of time talking about one particular application, there are a lot of tractable applications where this could bear a lot of fruit for cybersecurity. So those include malware, accounts, emails, domains, and devices. And so for something like malware, you could imagine a world where no longer are we worried about saying whether or not an executable is good or bad. We can say, hey, this executable is closest to a past version of Microsoft Word, or it's closest to a WannaCry exploit, or it's sitting somewhere in between them, which might lead us to other conclusions. And this is really kind of the power of embracing semantics for how we apply AI to the cybersecurity problem. So in conclusion, we've spent a lot of time talking about why we need to rebuild the foundation of how AI is being applied within the field. We focused on capturing semantics, planning for scalability, and designing for explainability. And we've laid out a methodology that's gonna get us to a place where our analysts can take our results and immediately formulate hypotheses in order to do their jobs better and keep our networks more secure. Thank you.